Hmm. Hey guys, can I mean hold on? Can you guys see me? So I hope you guys can also see my screen. I'm starting a little bit early. Uh, let me just minimize that. Starting a little bit early just so we can iron out any technical difficulties because uh, last time it was pretty embarrassing. I didn't have the software set up so you guys couldn't see my screen. Let me see. All right, cool. So. Um, in today's session, I want to go through with you guys just setting up the Xcode uh, War Card Game project in Xcode 10, I mean. And if you've gone through this again, then it's going to serve a bit as review. But if this is new to you, then I think you're going to learn a lot. The hardest thing that we're probably going to go through building this sort of app is mm, the content resistance priority uh, and content hugging priorities if so if you kind of understand that already then just sit back and relax <laughs> and uh, this stuff will be pretty much review but I think we're gonna have time at the end of that to do like a Q&A session uh, let me know if you guys can hear me uh, by typing in the chat <laughs> you fixed the screen share Yeah, Mr. Yup, I'm gonna build the whole thing. It's actually not gonna take too long. Hey guys, wow, so many people already. Thanks for joining me. And how many of you guys were actually here last week when you guys saw that I couldn't share my screen? If you guys were here for that, let me know. And we're just gonna start. We're gonna give another minute for people to join in and we're gonna, gonna start. Sound is good. You guys can see my screen. We're ready to rock. <laughs> And also, um, when I tried to show my entire desktop, I felt like it was hard to make out the, the actual um, file navigator and hard to, to see the screen. So I actually zoomed in a little bit onto Xcode. So uh, let me know when I start building the app um, how that is. Like, should I zoom in more for next time? And I'll take that into consideration so that I can adjust it because I wanna make sure that you guys can see uh, what I'm doing, otherwise it'd be pointless. Awesome, Sergio and Robert. I'm glad you guys are back. <laughs> I didn't, uh, I didn't lose your faith. Okay, so we're gonna begin now. It's one o'clock. I want to make sure that uh, I'm cognizant of your guys' time. So just a couple of words of uh, introduction to begin with. So welcome to the Code with Chris live stream. This is the second time I'm doing this. And so if I'm a little bit nervous, cut me a little bit of slack, I think I'll get uh, more comfortable with doing live streams as we go on. And also Adrian is manning the chat. So say hello to Adrian and to make his life easier, make sure you guys, if you have uh, like a question, type it all into the uh, one message and send that. Don't break it up into like five messages and try not to spam the chat as well or else he's gonna have a really hard time. Yeah, and uh, the last thing is that if you guys aren't in the Facebook community yet, you can go ahead and join that. We're there uh, supporting students, we're there discussing different topics and stuff like that. If you didn't know about it, it's at facebook.com slash groups slash code with Chris community. All right, so we're gonna begin. And if you have any questions, I'll be checking the chat periodically and I will try to answer all the questions at the end depending on how much time we have. All right, so here I am in the Xcode 10. We're gonna start a single view application. And I'm just gonna title this uh, War Card Game Demo. I'm just gonna save it to the desktop. Now this app does use some graphic assets. Some of them I created myself, some of them uh, the, particularly the playing cards I got off of someone else who uh, released them for free. Uh, I think they're not for free anymore, um, but I'm still using them. 
right now. So if I get in trouble, I'll change them. But you can download the same assets from codewithchris.com slash lesson four. And there's just a link to the zip file here under image assets. So those are the image assets that I'm gonna be using just in case you wanna follow along or you want to uh, do it yourself, try it yourself. So I've got that unzipped on my desktop right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually just gonna add all of these images into my asset library so we have them. So let's jump into the asset library here. If you're not sure this is the first time you're seeing this, you're new to iOS app development, this is where we keep all of our image assets that we're going to use in our app. And you might notice that each asset actually has three different sizes because the iPhone has different resolutions depending on what device it is. So recently I actually picked up the uh, iPhone 10s Max. So I'm really happy about that because it was like four years since I've upgraded my phone, I was using the iPhone 6 Plus. And that still uses the 3X graphics, but I mean, the phone now, it's so fast, I, I didn't know what I was missing because I would like switch apps and then I'd have to wait like five seconds before it switch. But now it's like instant. I don't know if you guys picked up the new devices or not, but man, they're getting way too expensive to buy every year. And I certainly, I didn't. I waited four years before I, I upgraded mine. Anyways, that's just a tangent. What we have right here, we have the background image, we have the back of the cards, we have cards from two all the way to uh, king and then ace. So you'll notice that I number these cards a certain way. I named them C-A-R-D, all in lowercase, with the number. Uh, that's because when we randomize these cards, we're basically gonna generate an, a random number from two, see, so card two right here, all the way to 14. So a number from two to 14, and then I just append card to it, and then we can load up this graphic asset that we have in the asset library. We also have some buttons and a logo. Actually, we have one button and one logo. I think the interesting part, especially if you've never done uh, iOS app development before, is gonna be this part, working in the storyboard and seeing all of these elements come together. Now, I, I know some of you guys are gonna ask this question, and I, I talked about it in the last stream, but you can generate all of this UI stuff through code. You don't have to use the storyboard, but for people who are just starting out, I feel like um, it's, it's a lot more intuitive. It's a lot less intimidating. And to be able to see something just come together visually like that uh, gives beginners especially a lot of motivation to continue and feel like they can do this and feel like it's something that they can achieve. So that's a lot of reason why I stick to using storyboards for all of my tutorials and demos because um, my target audience is more of on the beginner side. I wanna get the thing that gives me joy, the things that the reason why I started doing this in the first place was introducing like non-coders completely people who didn't program into the world of programming and building apps and seeing like their face light up and seeing just their mind open up uh, feeling like they can do this now and that gave me the most joy so that's that's where that's where i focus my teaching all right so where are we here the first thing we're going to do is add a ui image view into the uh the view here this is going to be our background image so we're going to add some constraints if that's new to you these constraints are basically rules that tell the system how to position all of the elements you're laying out so as you're going to see for this ui image view right we can set its property there's a drop down here we can set it to background but it's just going to be this little image right so we need to add some rules to tell the system how wide it is how tall it is how to position it and that's done through constraints. So all you need to do is click the element and then go down here. There's a menu where you can specify new constraints. We're gonna specify four constraints and we're basically specifying margins against the four sides at this point right here. Um, and there are a couple of options you can do here. So constraint to margins will basically, uh, there are some set margins for text. So, so let's say you're laying out a label or a text view or something like that. 
um, there are by default are margins on the left and right sides so the text doesn't go all the way to the left or all the way to the right so if you want things to reach all the way past the margins to the very edges of the screen you're going to uncheck constraint to margins and furthermore um, because like the iPhone 10 the new iPhones have a notch at the top and so there is something called a safe area where if you lay things out inside the safe area you can be guaranteed that it's not going to be blocked by the notch or blocked by any sort of elements like that uh, if you want things to ignore that safe area then you have to make sure that you pull down these drop downs here and by default they're set against the safe area we're going to change them to the view to make sure that uh, this background just goes edge to edge on all four sides of the screen. So that's why we're gonna do that. And I'm gonna reset them to all zeros. So we have a background like that. And when you change the width and height of the image view, what ends up happening also is that it stretches the image to fit. And so you can change this property called the content mode. So by default, it scales the image, but sometimes it gets stretched out. You can't really tell with a green background, but if you have like the card images or the logos, you're gonna see that they're gonna be stretched. So instead, we're gonna change it to aspect fill, and that's just going to maintain the aspect ratio of the original image so it doesn't just uh, get all skewed. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add um, a stack view. We're gonna use a vertical stack view, um, and a stack view is an element where you can put other elements inside and helps you order it. There's like a horizontal stack view and a vertical stack view, uh, which just stacks things either horizontally, like side by side, or vertically on top of each other. So uh, in our UI here, I don't, I don't know if you've seen it, but basically we have a logo at the top, then we have two cards side by side, then we have a button to deal the cards, and then below the button we have two score counters side by side. So we're gonna use a series of stack views uh, to create this sort of layout and we're gonna fine-tune it using the uh, content hugging and content compression resistance priorities so first thing to do is to add that vertical stack view because this vertical stack view is going to contain all of the elements so I'm going to add that right here as well and because this stack view contains the elements and I don't want any of the elements to be blocked by like the notch or any other hardware element when I specify the constraints for this guy, I'm going to leave it as constraint to the safe area. And I'm actually going to specify, uh, I'm gonna specify all four for now, but at the end, when we try to make this work for landscape and portrait, you're gonna see that maybe we should take away that bottom constraint because it ends up stretching it all the way to the bottom and it ends up spacing all the elements out a little too much. And so we might end up removing this bottom constraint, but I'm gonna leave it here for now. So add four, you can see it just starts clinging onto all four. And just give me a second when I double check that you guys are still seeing what I'm doing. Okay, cool. Because one of my worst fears is like, I'm just talking and talking and talking and no one sees me or no one, like my mic suddenly cuts out or the screen goes blank. So we're all good. All right, uh, we're gonna add the logo now. So the logo is another image, right? So we're gonna add another UI image view. So let's go ahead and do that. Just gonna drag it in there. And I'm gonna change the property for this image view to the logo. Now as you can see, it's gonna get all stretched out and that's because the stack view tries to uh, fill up all its space with the elements that it contains. Right now, it only contains the logo and so it's trying to stretch it all out we can change a couple of the properties to address this so you can see here on this left hand side this is called the uh, document outline and it basically lays out uh, shows you all of the elements that you have uh, in your view but it does it in a way where you can understand which elements are in front of each other so this guy is the root view of the view controller this is um, basically what the user is going to see on the screen. So anything that is close to the view is actually farther back. So you can see we have the background here, and then on top of the background is the stack view, 
And then you can see how this logo image is like tucked into the stack view. That means that the logo is inside the stack view. Um, I know it's a little counterintuitive because you think things in front should be at the top, but it's not. So things that are closer to the user in front of everything else is actually closer to the bottom of this document outline, just so you know. Uh, okay, so we're gonna add a couple of other elements in here. Uh, we're gonna add, oops, we're gonna add a, a horizontal stack view this time because we're gonna add the two card images. All right, so I'm just gonna drag this horizontal stack view in here. Uh, so now, the stack view has two elements inside. It has the logo and the horizontal stack view. And it's trying to stretch it all out to fill up all of that space in the vertical stack view. Um, but how does the system know which element it should stretch out and which one you know it should give more space to? Because before, when we just had the war logo, it was easy, just stretch that guy out to fill up the space. But now we have two elements, so which one is it gonna stretch out? Um, so you can see here it's selected the horizontal stack view to stretch out. Um, we can actually fine tune that and tell the system which element should be compressed or stretched out if there's more space or not enough space. And that's when those content hugging and content uh, compression resistance priorities come into play, which we'll fine tune at the end. Okay, so now what we've got here is a horizontal stack view, right? We're gonna add two image views into this horizontal stack view so that we can display two cards side by side. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so there's one image view and this is a second one. If your UI is starting to get kind of messy, you can also drag it directly into the document outline like this. Um, you just have to make sure that what we have here is the the vertical stack view contains the logo, which contain uh, sorry contains the logo and the horizontal stack view, and inside the horizontal stack we've got two image views like this. So we're gonna set some properties on this horizontal image view. So for the distribution, we're going to fill equally. That's gonna give equal space to both image views. So you can see that instantly uh, makes them equal. We're gonna add some spacing in between them, let's say 30. And right now I'm just gonna put some card images in here just so we have something to see and something to look at. But of course we're gonna be randomizing that at the end. All right, so what's next? We have a UI button. This is the deal button. So I'm going to add this element and I'm gonna drag it into the document view. You just have to be careful because for example, if I do that, I've actually put the button inside the horizontal stack view now, which I didn't want. Uh, sorry, didn't want. I want this button to be in the same level as uh, the logo and the stack view. And as you can see, I've actually put the button outside of that vertical stack view. So you just have to be very careful there. There we go. We've got the button inside now. So that stack view contains the logo, you know, the horizontal stack view, and then this button. And we're just gonna uh, add that last stack view, the horizontal stack view, which contains the two um, score counters. Before we start adjusting things and trying to make things look good. All right, so I've got that horizontal stack view in there and we've got a couple of labels. Now for the labels, um, we actually have like a player label and then the score. And then on the right hand side, we have like a CPU label and then the score underneath. And so what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to add two vertical stack views into the horizontal stack view. I know it's a little confusing at first, but once you start doing it, it's, uh, it's gonna be a lot easier to understand how to use stack views to build this guy up. I'm gonna review uh, what this looks like with you in just a second. I'm just gonna add a couple of st more stack views in here. I'm probably gonna lose you here if you, you've never done this before, actually. It's probably easier if I just add these elements first and then explain to you what's happening. All right, so let's, we've got all of the elements on our screen. I know it doesn't look like what it's supposed to, but we're gonna fix it in a second. 
But first, let me review what this uh, hierarchy uh, looks like. So we've got the vertical stack view right against the green background. And inside the vertical stack view, we have a logo. We have a horizontal stack view, which contains the two uh, card images. We have a button under that. And then we have another horizontal stack view underneath that. Inside that horizontal stack view, we have two vertical stack views side by side. And in each of these vertical stack views, we have two labels. So this is going to have the effect where the labels are on top of each other. And so now we're going to customize some of these elements before we uh, position them. So let's say for the button, for example, we can change the image of the button to the deal button image and then we can just erase the text like that. So that's gonna give us our uh, graphic there. And then for these labels, we can actually, uh, we can multi-select them. Let me just select a few of them like this. And then we're gonna change all of them to have a white color. And uh, we're gonna maybe give it a slightly bigger font if we wanted to. And for these, these two in particular up here, these, let me see if I can select that again. We're going to make these bold. So let's go to custom. Let's change it to a bold. And let's change the text in them. So this one, let's just say this is the player label. Uh, this guy is the CPU label. And then we'll have this is zero. And then this is zero. Okay, so now let's start positioning some of this stuff because this doesn't look the way we want to at all. All right, cool. So, uh, first of all, why don't we change this horizontal stack view? and change the distribution to fill equally. And then uh, we're also going to add some, uh, some padding between these labels like this, let's say 30. Uh, now this is completely arbitrary, right? It's the, whatever I want to fill them at. Uh, the alignment, we can change this one to trailing, right? So it's like up against that side. And you know how it's sticking to the very edge of the screen? We can adjust the margins of the vertical stack view in just a second so that we don't have it sticking right up against the edge of the screen. Um, for this vertical stack view right here, I want to change the spacing to 20 so that there's like a couple of, um, what do you call it? A couple of spacing, a bit of spacing in between each element. Uh, for this logo, it's uh, completely warped. We're going to change that to aspect fit. And these cards are kind of warped too. We're going to go aspect fit and aspect fit. This one actually looks bigger than this one to me. Or maybe my, no, I think my eyes are playing tricks on me. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's address this issue where these are close to the margin. See, this vertical stack view, we can actually adjust the constraints after we've added them. All you need to do is highlight that element, go into the size inspector tab here, and then you can see all of these different uh, elements. Uh, if you double click one of these constraints, it jumps you directly to that constraint. But if you just need to edit the spacing, like the constant of the constraint, then you can just click on this edit button here. So I can go ahead and change that from zero to let's say 20 and that's gonna see push that out a little bit um same thing with this leading one we're gonna just change that to 20 and so these are not so close to the edge there and now another thing we talked about the content hugging and uh content compression resistance priority right if we for example bring this guy up and we can change the orientation to see how this ui would look in a landscape sort of view. Uh, there's still enough space for all of the elements. So my point is kind of wasted, but I wanna tell you 
what those two things are, the content hugging and content priority, uh, sorry, content compression resistance priorities in case you've never heard of them before. So, huh, actually, no, a good, good thing is, it, is if I go into kind of like a smaller size class, let's say this guy, yeah, so you can see the logos gone right there, right? So at different screen sizes, we have different sort of uh, screen real estate. And how does the system decide which elements to squish, compress? And if, on the other hand, there's a lot of space, how does it decide which elements to give more space to, to stretch out? That all has to do with these two properties right here, content hugging priority and content compression resistance priority. And the way you come in here is you select the element and then you go into the size inspector on the right hand side here. Near the bottom, you'll see these two uh, attributes. Uh, there's a horizontal and a vertical for each. And this basically says, for example, the content hugging priority. If there is uh, too much space, right? The higher priority, the, the highest content hugging priority means that it's going to think of it as hugging the content. It's not going to allow it to uh, expand. So the element which has the lowest content hugging priority will, get, will be the one that gets stretched out. So you can kind of control it, right? Uh, I think by default, they're all like 251 for this one. So it's kind of random, but if you wanted to control it, you would basically go through all of the elements and decide. You would assign different priorities. Let's say on the vertical aspect, uh, if I expect there to be more space uh, on certain screen sizes and I want the cards to stretch out, then I'm going to give the cards the lowest vertical uh, hugging content priority. So that means that the cards will get stretched out versus anything else. So the opposite is content compression resistance priority. On a screen which has um, no space or too little space, which element gets squished? And the element with the lowest resistance priority is the one that gets squished, or it might completely disappear. So as you can see, it chose our logo to get squished here. Uh, if we wanted to change that, all we needed to do would be to highlight our logo here and then give it a high resistance priority on the vertical axis, right? And then it's gonna make sure because this guy right now has the highest compression resistance priority, it's not gonna squish it. It's gonna squish the other elements which has a lower resistance priority. So that's how you kind of control that stuff. All right, so, you know, how this UI looks, it's going to depend on how you adjust those different uh, priorities. But what I want to do on these larger screens like this is I don't particularly like that all of these elements stretch all the way to the bottom of the screen and there's so much space. And it's because we have our vertical stack view um, stretched out all the way to the bottom of the screen. And so it's gonna have to try to space those elements out for the whole, uh, the whole view height wise. But however, if I go into the size inspector for that root stack view and we double click that bottom constraint and we just go ahead and just completely blow it away, um, that's going to allow that vertical stack view to, to just have a natural size depending on what the elements are inside of it. And so you can see that this looks a lot more natural Right. We're going to hook up some of the code now. So this is the storyboard. This is the view we've been using interface builder. If that's new to you, that's what it's called to build this sort of interface. But now we have to uh, expose all of these elements to the code behind or the view controller so that we can write Swift code to dynamically power these elements. Uh, one way you can do that, there's multiple ways, but one way you can do that is just click on this button up here called show the assistant editor, and it's going to show the view controller for this particular view. As long as up here, you have it set to automatic. Now, actually, this is a source of um, confusion for a lot of beginners. 
and sometimes it's set to manual, right? It might, might have selected something else. So then what they see on the right hand side isn't what they should be seeing if they want to hook up, like uh, expose these elements to the code behind. What you should do is just click this, go to automatic, and then select view controller or whatever it suggests as the automatic thing. So that when you select one of these elements inside that view, it's going to show you the corresponding view controller on the right hand side. Um, okay, so all we need to do is expose some of these elements so that we can control it through code. We're going to need to expose the, uh, the card image view, both of them, so we can change the images through code. We're going to have to handle taps on this button uh, and we're going to have to change the scores on these two labels right here. So first of all, we're going to create some space underneath here inside our view controller class. And we're going to hold down control on our keyboard and just click this card and simply drag it. A blue line should be following your mouse and you just let go. And the connection type should be outlet and then you can just name it whatever you want. So this could be, uh, let's say this is the this is the player card. Okay, and we're going to do the same thing for this one. This guy is going to be the CPU card. Uh, and then we've got this label here. So let's call this player score label. And then we've got this CPU label as well. All right, and finally, we've got the button. So for this button, instead of exposing it as an IB outlet property, which is, you can think of it as just exposing the element to have a reference to that element in the storyboard, we're going to hook this guy up with an IB action handler. And so that is actually a function where you can type in code that would happen if the user were to tap that button. So in Xcode 10, it's pretty smart because it's going to know that's what you're trying to do. So you hold down control. Again, it's the same procedure, but this time when you drag it, you're going to put it down here underneath this function. And the connection type is action instead of outlet. And I'm going to name this uh, deal tapped. All right, so now all we have to do is randomize a number. And one way we can do that is use this function called uh, arc for random underscore uniform, and we can specify an upper bound. Now, if we specified 14, this would basically randomize numbers from 0 to 13. And I always kind of forget this, but if I remember correctly, if you specify an upper bound of 14, uh, it's going to give you 0 to 13. And we'll find out soon enough anyways. Because we have card starting at 2, we need to go from 2 to 14 instead, right? So uh, that random function is going to give us starting at 0. So we need to add 2 to that 0. So whatever the number gives us, we're just going to add 2 to it. So if it randomizes 0, we're going to essentially treat that as a 2. If it randomizes 1, we're going to treat that as a 3. The problem is, if we specify an upper bound of 14 and we get 13, and we add 2 to that, we're going to get 15. And we don't have cards that go up to 15, right? We only have 2 to 14. And so instead, I'm going to specify an upper bound of 13. And so the highest number it's going to give us is 12. So 12 plus 2 is 14. And that's going to be our upper bound with what we have here in terms of card images too. So I'm going to specify an upper bound of 13. So let's write this gives us numbers from 0 to 12, then we add 2, just so you don't forget, right? So we're going to specify, uh, so we're going to randomize a number from 0 to 12 and then add 2. And then we're going to assign this to a variable here so we can keep track of it. So we're going to say let, uh, let player number equals that, and then we're going to randomize one for I'm just going to copy and paste. We're going to randomize one for uh, CPU. So CPU number is the same thing right there. And then now we're going to change the card image or the uh, the image view for the player card. All right, those warnings are just saying that we haven't used this 
constant yet, but we're not finished coding it up. So we can ignore those for now. So the player card, which is an image view element, actually has an image property, which we can set to a UI image view object. So we're gonna create a new UI image view object and the UI image, sorry, I was saying UI image view object. No, we're gonna set it to a UI image object. The UI image class has an initializer which accepts a string uh, specifying the file name or the, the graphic asset name. So for example, uh, we would specify card 10 if we wanted to show card 10. And this would essentially uh, take that graphic asset that we have in our graphic asset library and it would create a UI image object and then set it to the player card image view. Only problem is we want to randomize that, right? We don't want to show card 10 every single time. And so instead of specifying 10 there, we're just going to put our player number, right? Um, this is the number which we randomized here. Uh, the problem is that we can't add a string, which is this piece of text, with a number. So we can just convert this number to a string as well, like that. And then that's gonna allow us to add that random number to the end of the word card. And then we're gonna essentially change the image in that image view. Now we're gonna do the same thing here in CPU card. And so we can test it out now before, before we go any further. Let's do it this way. So it's gonna take a while to boot up the simulator and run. Meanwhile, let me check out some of your guys' comments. Oh, thank you, Beast Motor. <laughs> yep, uh, Abbas, this is gonna be recorded. So every week I'm gonna try to do a live stream and I'll record it and um, even if you can't make it at that time, uh, you can always catch up on it later. All right, so we've got this load it up. When I tap on deal, it's going to fire up this function right here. Okay. And it's going to randomize two numbers and display them in the image views as well. All right. So we can see this happening. If you happen to get a blank card, that means that it couldn't find that image uh, that we're trying to specify. And if that were to happen to you, um, then I would double check the random numbers range that you have set because you've probably uh, specified a number and it attached it to the word card and it couldn't find that graphic asset in your asset library. And so that's why it ends up showing a blank. So, and what we're gonna do next is show the, update the scores for the player in the CPU. So we have the two labels exposed as IB outlet properties. So we actually have a reference to those elements from here. Uh, and you can say update labels. Um, and the easiest way that mm, I did it before that I felt like made it easier for beginners to understand was to have a separate property here to keep track of the score. Uh, so, you know, you have a player score and a CPU score like this, and then they would both be initialized to zero. Um, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Brain fart. Okay, so we have our properties, player score and CPU score. They're both initialized to zero and zero. And if we were to update the labels, well, first we would update the score. Update the score, and then we update the labels, right? So, uh, in order to determine who wins, it's very easy the way that we've set it up. Basically, the higher the random number, uh, 
the, the better off you are. Because in here, in the asset library, the lowest card is two, so that's card two, and the highest card is ace, which is card 14. And so what we end up doing is just comparing it. So uh, we, we basically say if player number is greater than the CPU number, then we update, we increment the player score. That means day one, right? So we can uh, append one to whatever score it was. And that's what this plus equal means. It's just incrementing it right there. And then we can update the player label um, at the same time. So let me erase this and we can say player score label is now uh, has a text property and that is equal to the string, uh, the converted string of player score. So we're basically converting that integer, that number into a string so that we can set it to the text property of the label. Um, else if CPU number is greater than the player number, then uh, in this case, the CPU one. So we increment the CPU score instead. And because this was a beginner tutorial, I didn't handle uh, what happens in a tie. I know some, some people who, who got the hang of this really quickly and wanted to go beyond this, they wanted to figure out like, oh, if there's a tie, because I think in the real war card game, what happens is like you you open up another set of cards, right? And then whoever ends up winning gets gets like all of the points, like wins the whole round. Um, so I didn't implement anything like that. And I just left the tie scenario alone. I didn't do that. Ah, and another, another word is that, you know, I'm using things like if statements and, you know, I'm talking about like properties and stuff like that. If this is like your first time, very first time learning iOS development, seeing Swift code, this is probably still going to confuse the hell out of you. Right? There's no way I can take an hour to explain everything from the very, very beginning. And so what I would recommend is you follow our beginner series, which is just like 10 lessons long. And you actually build out this very same app, except that I take it like step by step, very slow, assuming you know nothing. And that whole thing is probably like three hours long, maybe. Um, but yeah, so like I'm going through this live version pretty quickly. And I know that if this was the first time you're seeing this, you have no idea what these keywords are, right? If, else, if, and stuff like that. But I would recommend that you go back and watch the beginner series instead. And maybe Adrian can uh, provide a link to it. But you'll also find it if you just visit my channel page, it's like the first playlist. Um, and then that will teach you stuff from the very, very beginning. And we'll talk about things like if statements, else ifs, uh, you'll know what stack views are, auto layout constraints, and there are exercises you can do as well. So I highly recommend that. Okay, so now what we, what we have is the score updating, I think. So let's give this a run and let's check it out. Yeah, so it seems to be working. So I saw a comment in there talking about uh, talking about taking this further and doing like a back end to it. Uh, I think that would be very interesting. Like if you actually can connect to a live player and do it. If any of you guys want to dig into that, feel free. Um, I highly recommend that you join our Facebook community and do it in there so that we can all talk about it and discuss it. Um, but my whole point of doing this war card game in this very, very simple form was just to get people's feet wet, right? I know a lot of you guys who are watching right now, you've been following Code with Chris and the channel for a while now. This is probably like easy stuff for you. Um, but yeah, so th that's why I don't tend to take this further than this because this is kind of the most basic app that I can think of that's still semi-interesting for beginners to do. Uh, so that's why uh, I keep it like that. But um, there are other app tutorials on my channel that are completely outdated by now. So I'm talking about like, there's we have a soundboard app, we have a YouTube uh, feed app, which, we're, which you can like connect to a channel and show videos. And we have like a shopping app with Molten. So those, those tutorials are kind of outdated now, unfortunately. But 
I hope that you've noticed in the past week and this week, we're putting a lot more emphasis in producing content because I'm finished with producing the courses that I was so busy doing before. Um, so now I'm, my focus is back to uh, creating content for this channel for you guys and doing live streams with you guys, getting to know you guys and uh, really finding out what you wanna learn. Um, so long story short, <laughs> I wanna hear what sorts of uh, app tutorials you guys wanna see on this channel. If there's any particular tutorials on the channel you think should be a priority to be refreshed and updated, let me know. I have a couple of app ideas that I actually wanna build out from the ground up with you guys. I think that would be really cool to follow along. Uh, my, I think my main difficulty is, um, I mentioned before that I, I get the most joy out of seeing people who have no coding and then bringing them, them into the coding world and seeing their face light up and that light bulb moment go off in their head and th them realizing that this is possible. Um, balance, balancing creating content for you know those people versus um, doing content for people who are beyond that. You know, people like you guys who, some of you guys who have been following Code with Chris a little longer. And I don't just want to focus on the beginner stuff because, you know, I have a confession to make, <laughs> if you will, is, and that's that, like, I've been doing the beginner stuff for so long that um, I wouldn't say my brain has rotted, but, but, like, I'm just so used to teaching that stuff. And then I have my personal and family life um, as well. And so I don't have, you know, that much time to keep my skills sharp in terms of the more advanced and intermediate stuff. And so that's why I also want to um, cover that stuff and learn alongside. It's almost like I have to relearn a lot of that stuff because things are constantly changing, right? Um, so that's why I also want to do more intermediate advanced topics, which I will have to do learning myself. Um, and that will put myself in your shoes as well so we can learn together. Um, and then I can continue also to update the beginner stuff for all of the beginners uh, who come on the channel. Uh, yeah. Let's ch check out the chat now. I think we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, so Beast Motor, social networking apps personally interest me. You know, that is... Um, that is something that I, I, I never understand. Like people, a lot of people want to do social networking apps, but then I don't really understand what that means. Like, do you want to make your own Facebook? Do you want to make your own Instagram? Like wh what does a social networking app mean to you? Let me know because uh, a lot of people, they say they want to do social networking apps. And my uh, the thing I would fire back at you is, can you be more specific and really iron out like, what people are able to do in that social networking app idea of yours. Uh, someone asks, can we download the source code? Uh, yeah, I'll make this available for you guys. And uh, the image assets, I have a link to the image assets. I think it might be on this page actually. No, I think it was on the old version of this page, but like in one of my really old videos, um, I had the link to the image assets, but you can download them from here, uh, from this codewithchris.com slash lesson four. And whether or not you can use that in your own projects that you uh, publish commercially, I, I don't think so anymore because I think he changed the licensing terms before it was like completely free, do whatever you want with it. But um, for myself here, I'm just, I'm not even publishing these apps, right? It's just for demo purposes. So I don't think I'm gonna get in trouble for using it like this, but if you were gonna publish your app, then I would make sure you double check twice. Uh, what's the difference with the Xcode 10 version of this app versus others? No, there's, there's really no difference. Um, yeah, I just did this kind of on the fly and I didn't, there wasn't anything different aside from that object library being moved. Um, uh, I think a lot of people might be confused with that. So that really is the only difference, but in terms of like the auto layout stuff and laying out your elements, nothing's really changed. I did this more of like 
an exercise for myself and also for the benefit if there were any beginners in the audience today. Uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions for me right now, go ahead and type it into the chat and I'll see if I can answer them. Okay, so someone mentions BuildBox. I did want to check out BuildBox before. If you're not familiar with it, it's like, uh, I guess, a drag and drop visual builder for games. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure you can add like bits of code to it, but it's supposed to be uh, like building games without code. So you can go and check that out. And someone's saying, Sergio is saying it's not that great. I haven't tried it myself because when I was interested in it, it's actually really expensive. I think they've lowered the price of using the software now. And I'm not sure uh, if you publish games using BuildBox, if if they take a cut of it or anything like that, I'm not sure. But in the last live stream, someone mentioned that I should start covering SpriteKit, which I'm 100% behind. Um, let me see here. Sridhar asks, hi Chris, how do we add functionalities into our app icon on the iPhone's main menu? If you 3D tap on the icon and see some extra, like that force tap, a 3D touch tap to, uh, you know, honestly, I'm not sure, but I know it's probably not that hard to do. Um, I'd have to check out the, the SDK and take a look at the iOS documentation for that. So. You know what, we'll write that down as a, a content suggestion. So it could come up as a, a future tutorial, but in all honesty, I don't think it'd be very hard to do. So things like that, usually um, usually you might even be able to specify in a P list. It might be a P list thing. Okay, so I think Adrian's doing a pretty good job with the questions, actually. Um, <laughs> nothing too much there. Um, if you guys have any suggestions for what you want me to cover in like a future live stream or any like tutorial requests, please let me know. I really want to do stuff that you guys want to see. And this week, the other tutorial that I'm going to be publishing on the channel is how to integrate AdMob ads with uh, with Firebase. So I've been actually using the community posts to ask you guys to do polls to see if you guys wanna see that sort of content or not. And you guys have been great. Like I think the last poll, I asked the ad mob question. I don't know if you've, saw, you've seen it, but it, there were like 700 replies and 61% of you guys said you wanted to see it. Like about 20% said it could be useful and another like small percentage, like 14% of you guys said you completely didn't want to see something like that. So it's very good feedback, right? Of course, I can't cater to every single person. I can't make everyone happy, but at least this gives me sort of a barometer of uh, whether or not I should proceed with that content, you know, because I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste your time, to be honest. Yeah, ad mob ads would be awesome. Cool. It's actually really easy to do. Like, I think you're going to be surprised once you see the video. Yeah, <laughs> I'm seeing my my own because uh, I have a laptop here and I'm seeing my own live stream just so I can see the chat and I can see my own screen to see what you guys are seeing. And I realize I talk with my hands a lot. <laughs> hey, Luca. Hey, Robert. Good suggestion. So Robert suggests small talk about being a mobile app developer, how to start a career in the field. Um, So specifically like working as a mobile app developer, right? Not not being an indie app developer, building your own apps and trying to make money off of that, right? Because that part I don't know too much about. 
And there are actually a couple of indie app developers that are on YouTube and they've published apps and stuff and they, they do videos about, um, I guess, vlogs about their process and all that stuff. And so I thought it'd be really interesting to interview them. Maybe I can reach out to them and grab an interview and see what it's actually like to be, to make a living from developing apps. And obvious, obviously for me, I don't make a living from building apps. Um, and I don't build apps, f I don't do consulting anymore, so I don't work for a company. 100% um, of my income is coming from uh, support of you guys um, through YouTube and through uh, my course, my private courses on my site where, where you can get a, a bit more of my time to help you individually on your iOS journeys. But I can talk about like based off of my experience of working in software consulting as a mobile de uh, app developer, I can tell you things change so fast though. Like honestly, that was five years ago. And um, even the tools that we use, um, I'm meeting up with some of my ex colleagues tomorrow for lunch. So I'm going to bring that up and ask them, you know, what sorts of tools they use these days and how it's changed since we were working together. Um, but you know, it was a lot of fun, but for me, maybe it was just the company. It was very, very stressful because, um, you know, the, the business person is selling these projects to clients and clients are paying like 50 K upwards of 50 K to build like a mobile application. And the team is like maybe one or two developers, a designer, a project manager. So it's like four people delivering this big project over like a month. And there would be consistently kind of like tight timelines and things always go wrong. You can't expect anything to go perfectly. Um, and so I would end up having to pull like a lot of late nights and that was fine before I had kids and before well, like when I was younger and <laughs> I was able to do more of that type of hard work. But now I think like I would just be completely wiped if I had no sleep and I pulled an all nighter. I don't think I could function the next day. Um, and then I just started questioning myself if, if health wise, that was like the right thing for me. And I, I don't mean to scare you guys that are looking for jobs because I know a lot of companies out there aren't like that, you know, so I'm saying my company was a small company. They might not have been selling their projects correctly. They might not have been scoping it out, making sure there's adequate like time and budget to do things and instead putting that pressure on the employees. Right. So this is like an isolated experience. I'm not telling you that this is what it's like to work in iOS out there. It's just, you know, I can only speak to what I've experienced. So I know for consulting, um, the benefit is that you get to work on a lot of different app projects um, because it was cool. Like every two months, every month to two months, we would be working on a different app and starting all over from scratch, getting requirements from the client, like designing it, building it, and then, you know, I think you get a lot of good experience that way versus if you worked at uh, like one company, let's say mm, a big company, like a bank who has a mobile app and you would just be um, working on that same app for years on end, right? You'd be maintaining it. It'd be like probably a much larger app, um, but you would be working essentially on different features or maybe new features of the same app. Um, and also the timelines probably wouldn't be as strict and probably wouldn't be as um, hectic. So that's in my eyes, that's kind of the difference between consulting and working um, in the industry is what uh, is what that term is. Yeah, Robert. Um, Sharing some personal stories. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, also, my wife, uh, Ellen, is also working with me now on Code with Chris. And before, she was also working with me in the software consulting company. And so she was working as a project manager. Um, and so she would, you know, scope out the timeline, scope out the tasks, manage the client expectations, and, you know, do the, do the meetings with the client, all that stuff. So she has perspective from that end of things, whereas I was um, a senior software developer, so I would lead the team of developers. So it, it's cool. I think I can get her, if I can convince her to get on the camera, I can get her to do some some talks too, to share her 
uh, side, her point of view from the project manager side of uh, the software development industry. Uh, so Robert, regarding the recent workflow, so I mentioned that I'm going to start, I'm going to start a series on this channel where I'm, I'm taking one of my app ideas and I'm just going to start it from, do it from start to finish and we're going to publish it together. And so that's what I'm hoping uh, will be helpful for you guys to see that workflow uh, all the way from, you know, from specifying requirements and all that stuff to designing, like to doing the information architecture, like the wireframes first, and then turning into a design and then development and bringing those design pieces into development and then publishing it together. I'm going to hold like a special celebration or a stream and you actually like hit publish and get it into the app store. Uh, Alienware Ninja, thanks. Thank you for your kind words. <laughs> All right, so I think that's that about wraps it up for today. Um, my plans are to do another live stream next week, and I'm going to show you guys something else. Maybe we'll do something a little harder. Maybe we'll just pick one of the apps that are outdated in our channel and update them together. Um, but I'll show you code. That's for sure. I'm not going to um, as much like. You know, I don't know what's more helpful to you guys. Would it be more helpful if I just did a live stream and just did an hour of Q&A and you guys just, you know, throw in the questions and I'll answer them for you? Or would you rather see me build something, teach something, uh, see my screen, uh, do that? Let me know. I want to make uh, the live stream helpful for you guys. Uh, so Sodar says he created a note-taking app called Darkpad, and it and it's published in the App Store. So guys, check him, check it out, support him, leave him a positive review. Wow, you made six dollars with a banner ad. That's awesome because I, to be honest, I actually I did I did release an app with some banner ads and it didn't do that that well. But we'll see, we'll see. We'll build some apps together and we'll publish them to the store. All right, I'll see you guys later, okay? I'll see you guys next week. Same time, same day um, next week. See you guys later. Bye for now.